welcome to talks at Google from Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is a, a topic uh, near and dear to my heart as a, as a cyclist, so I'm uh, very pleased to introduce Margaret Goroff, who's written a fascinating cultural history of the bicycle and its surprisingly broad impact on life in this country, which we'll speak about today. Uh, Margaret is a magazine writer and editor with a broad experience in features, essays, and investigative work. Uh, her regional and national awards include the A.D. Emmert Prize for Writing in the Humanities. A longtime writing teacher and public speaker, and Goroff is also the editor and publisher of Power Moby Dick, an online annotation of Herman Melville's classic novel. Uh, she attended Wesleyan and John Hopkins Universities with degrees in English and nonfiction writing, and she teaches nonfiction writing to grad students at John Hopkins. She was an editor at Baltimore Magazine and is currently executive editor at the AARP Magazine. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. I'm really happy to be at Google, particularly. Um, this book wouldn't be the book it is without Google Books. So if any of you works for Google Books, I'd like you to come up later so I can hug you <laughs> and perhaps not stop hugging you. Um, this is my book. And um, I was advised to start with a joke, so I have one for you. He says, I'm looking forward to the time when I shall make you one of the happiest of women. And she says, you are very kind, sir, but I do not think my father would allow me to accept a bicycle from you. So what's going on here? This is a young woman, right, who would rather have a bicycle than a fiance. Well, if you know much about the history of the United States, you know that in this period, there was a major bicycle boom going on. Um, they seemed to be everywhere. Everyone either wanted one or had one. In fact, in 1898, the year after this appeared in the Yonkers Statesman, um, of all the national advertising in the United States, 10% was for bicycles or bicycle parts. So they were really kind of inescapable in this period. And as a result, they were very influential in this period. But if you start looking at U.S. history for bicycles, you start to see them everywhere and discover that they really had a big impact on the way we have lived as a country from their appearance here at the beginning of the 19th century and through to the present day, which is something that people are not as aware of, and that's why I wrote this book. So what I'd like to do is I'll read you some, a chunk of chapter three, but first I'd like to give you a little slideshow to catch you up to that part. So we'll do about 15 minutes of slides, 15 minutes of reading, and then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So this is the first proto beginning bicycle that appeared in this country. It was invented in 1817 in Germany, arrived here by 1819, they started to build them. It's called a Drezin, after the guy who invented them, Baron von Drez. Looks a lot like a bicycle, right? But there's one crucial thing missing, which is the pedals. So this was more of a kind of a glider. You had to Fred Flintstone your way across the countryside, which is what that guy is doing over there in the corner. Um, it was made of iron originally. They could also make them of wood. Um, very expensive um, you had, because you had to have them made you know, by a, a, an artisan for you. So um, these were for rich people. But they were fascinating to everyone because they could go up to nine miles an hour, which is as fast as a horse trots. And this is the first thing that most people had seen that could go as fast as a horse. Um, so there was a mania up for these in France, in England, and also here during this period. Um, people th thought they might replace the horse. But in the end, um, they were very heavy, right? They were fun to go downhill on, uphill not so much, you know? This is 50 pounds or more. Um, and another important thing, particularly in this country, was that the roads just couldn't accommodate this kind of locomotion. Most of them were not paved, so most of them were rutted and muddy or dusty, or they had things growing up out of them, or they would go to a certain point and then stop. Even the ones that were paved had cobblestones kind of up and down, or you know, some, some later on, some were made of wood and they would rot. But So at this time, um, this was really more of a, a toy than something that people could really get around on or, or that could, be, could replace a horse. Um, so it had a brief uh, fashion, and then it sort of went away. Another thing I wanted to mention about the 19th century that you may know is that um, women, middle class and upper class women during this whole century and prior to this, 
dressed in long dresses. It was considered indecent to show your ankles. And these dress, it wasn't just a dress, it was a dress plus underskirts to make them puff out like that. In this period, a, a hoop skirt, later on maybe a bustle. Um, you could be, even if you weighed only 105 or 110 pounds as a little woman, you could wear 25 pounds worth of clothing. And so in addition to all the skirts and underskirts, they needed a corset, something to really cinch in their waist, but not just to make them look skinnier, but actually to act as kind of a scaffolding to hang all this clothing off of. So when you see a woman dressed like this, you know she's also very constrained by some kind of corset that's helping hold it all up. Now, with these long skirts, dragging in the mud or the horse manure or whatever you had on the road, um, it wasn't very healthy with this, this constraining corset, and people knew that, reformers knew that, and at this period in 1851, they were talking about something that made more sense for women. There was a rational dress movement. This is Amelia Bloomer, a newspaper editor. She advocated this kind of a costume, which is still very modest, but doesn't drag on the ground, doesn't have all this heavy fabric. This was called a Bloomer costume, she and several other feminists were very um, strong supporters of this costume. They were widely mocked. People didn't want to wear this. Women did not want to wear this. And even Amelia Bloomer stopped wearing it after a couple of years because she couldn't get anything done because people were pointing at her and laughing. So what women had an option. A, a, they could have adopted a different way of dress, but they chose not to. They didn't want to do that at this period. That's background. Um, so history, yada, yada, yada. This is the next iteration of the bicycle. It's called a pedal velocipede. This is from the US patent in 1866. You can see there's a new addition. It looks a lot like the Draisine, which was also called a velocipede, but now you've got pedals on the front axle. So you can actually churn and move without your feet touching the ground. So this is a new scientific marvel. They couldn't figure out, like they, people would see this thing coming and they couldn't figure out how is it going? How is this person moving without touching the ground? This was also very heavy. The top part would be still iron. These uh, wheels were made of wood, so they look like wagon wheels. That's basically what they were. This goes a little faster, racing indoors maybe 12 miles an hour. Another fad erupts in Europe and also here by 1869. This is a scene from a velocipede riding school in New York because think about it, right? Nobody knew how to ride a bike. They didn't exist. So these schools opened. People had to learn how to balance, how to pedal on these heavy things. And then there was a huge demand for them. And there was this expectation that when the weather got warm, this was a winter scene, when the weather got warm this year, people would be able to take these out on the open road and ride them as if they were horses. They would be, you know, for people who couldn't afford a horse, a, an affordable way to get around, even though they were still pricey for, they weren't for working people. These would cost like $100 to $150, and people would be earning maybe $12 or $13 a month. Um, but what happened here is that they, they loved these things, they learned to ride them, and then when the weather got warm enough, they took them out onto the crappy American roads and they couldn't get anywhere. So within a year in this country, these kind of faded away as well, for the most part. People rode them somewhat, some people rode them, but they, didn't, they weren't fashionable. They, there was no more mania here. Now, in Europe, where the roads were better, um, people continued to develop these. And one of the first and most important developments was had to do with the wheels. Because they knew that if you um, want to go faster on a bicycle, if you make the wheel bigger, the driving wheel, you can go farther for each turn of the pedals. But these, with these wooden wheels, um, they were so heavy that you couldn't really make them much bigger because nobody would be able to actually crank them. So what they did was they started using what we still use today, which is wires um, under tension to make a lighter weight wheel that you can make much bigger. And these got to be as big as twice the length of the rider's legs. You would order them the way you order suits, right? Um, and this is one of the first American ones. Again, they, they were developed in Europe in 1870, came over here bit by bit, and then by 1878, they were being manufactured in this country. Um, and so this now is a fast machine. It looks quaint to us. It looks like you would ride it as a joke or if you're a clown. No, it was, it was 
uh, supersonic for them. It was high tech. It was the fastest thing they'd ever seen. These go 17 miles an hour. Now you're going faster than a horse because you can go longer than a horse. And because the arch of this wheel is so gentle, they actually roll over a lot of the bumps in the road that the smaller wheel got caught in. So this is really the first bicycle that was up to America's horrible roadways. And this is a scene from a sporting book. Now, what you see here, he's riding on the, in outdoors, getting, having a grand old time. She is riding side saddle. And you can see she still has that long skirt. And she's, in the story, she's looking longingly at him. Historically, they were looking longingly at the bike. So they wanted this. They wanted to go this fast, women and older people who couldn't get up on these things because this is, you know, it go, went fast, so it was difficult to ride for that reason. Also, it was hard to get up on. You know, you had to be strong. You had to be nimble. You had to, like, run, get it going, and then kind of climb up, climb up the back of it. And then, you know, it was a fixie, basically, so the pedals are going. So then you have to kind of get your feet on the pedal. It was very difficult. So for women and for older people, the uh, manufacturers developed these crazy-looking tracks. Bicycles. And these are the big, this is what they call spider wheels, the wire spoke tension wheels, um, three of them. This is a very heavy machine, still very expensive, costs about one and a half times the bicycle, which is now still $100 and people are earning more, but not that much more. Um, these are, uh, they require a smoother road because you have three tracks that you need to get along. So if you have two smooth tracks and the third one hits something, well, you kind of tip over. They were very heavy, so you get stuck there. Um, so these are not a perfect vehicle. They were better than nothing for women. But what the manufacturers saw was that there was still a market for something that was safer, that wasn't this towering thing that could go fast and that um, older people and women could ride. And that's when you get this. So in 1885 in England, in 1887, this was the first American made, called a safety bicycle. The addition here is the chain, the bicycle chain. You can see around the pedals. And what that allows is for the driving wheel, which is now the rear wheel, to turn more than once for every time you crank the pedals. So this, also a racing machine. But it's sold as a safety as something that is that is um, more safe for people who don't want to climb up on that tall wheel, which, by the way, also could really throw you off. Because you're sitting, when you're on that big wheel bike, you're sitting um, with your center of gravity right on top of the bicycle. And so if you do hit something on the roadway, you go plummeting. And head injuries were a big problem with that, that high wheel style. For this, you have, still have these hard wheels. These would be wood wheels or uh, the rims or um, hard rubber. And so you go back to the problem of roughness in the road. So now you have a fast vehicle that's low enough, but it doesn't have the cushioning. And that's when they added this, which is the pneumatic tire. So this is the complete package. This is an air-filled tire to cushion the bumps in the road. It's low. It's fast. Um, these were invented in 1888 by um, Dunlop in Ireland, and they came over here shortly thereafter. And so the only thing that's missing to get a woman on this bike is just the drop frame. Take that crossbar and drop it down so that she can get her skirts through. They wouldn't be like this huge, voluminous skirts, but she could still wear a, an ankle-length skirt and ride a bicycle. And some of them wore bloomers. So this comes back, right? So now you have... In, in the mid, by the mid-1890s, you have possibly a young woman who would rather have a bicycle than a fiancé, right? She's got her drop frame here. She's got her cushioned tires here. And she's got this bloomer suit that allows her freedom. It was still considered indecent. It's not that, they, that their perceptions, their aesthetics had changed. What had changed was that these young women were willing to endure ridicule at the beginning in order to be able to ride a bicycle because it was that important to them. And what was important was being able to go where they wanted to go. Because women in this period were very constrained in where they could properly go. And if you didn't have a horse and carriage and driver, you couldn't really get very far. If you uh, wanted to go out, usually, you would need to have a chaperone in order for it to be proper. But with a bicycle, you didn't need that. So this woman is threatening to the social order, not only because she is indecently displaying the shape of her calf, but because she can go where she wants to go. She's independent, and that was very threatening. So with all that said, I would like to uh, read to you some from the book. And we're starting in a couple years after this, 1896. 
So this is a headline from the July 2nd, 1896 New Haven Register. Moralists warned that skimpy costumes and unsupervised travel would lead to wanton behavior. Immodest bicycling by young women is to be deplored, declared Charlotte Smith, founder of the Women's Rescue League, a group that lobbied Congress on behalf of fallen women. Bicycling by young women has helped to swell the ranks of reckless girls who finally drift into the army of outcast women. Smith reported that her tours of brothels and interviews with prostitutes confirmed this. Physicians, who at the time shouldered responsibility for patients' moral as well as physical well-being, had their own concerns. One visited New York's Coney Island and saw a 16-year-old cyclist get drunk on wine provided by a beautiful but nefarious older woman. She looked like an innocent child but was away from home influence, the doctor reported. And this part, I'm just going to paraphrase because it's being videotaped, but um, doctors were also concerned about uh, the, the pressure from the bicycle seat would cause teenagers to get ideas about certain solitary sexual practices that they wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, and this was considered to be dangerous to their, um, their spiritual well-being. But the bicycle's peril was medical as well as moral. In the late 19th century, many saw physical energy as a finite resource that had to be carefully parceled out, not a power to be renewed through exercise. The fashionable malaise of neurasthenia was only one of the disorders thought to be caused by a depletion of energies. Overexertion could also cause tuberculosis, scoliosis, hernias, heart disease, and other maladies, doctors believed. Safely sedentary middle class women, who frequently suffered from varicose veins and other consequences of annual pregnancies, were prone to fatigue. One Boston writer called them a sex which is born tired adding that society seems little better than a hospital for invalid women. Particularly for women in heavy dresses and constraining corsets, any activity that raised the heart rate could seem more likely to be the cause of fainting and listlessness than their remedy. Opponents of the bicycle latched onto this perception, arguing that riding would cost women more effort than they could afford. The exertion necessary to riding with speed is productive of an excitation of nervous and physical energy that is anything but beneficial, Charlotte Smith warned. If a halt is not called soon, 75% of the cyclists will be an army of invalids within the next 10 years. But even as Smith made her dire predictions, Americans' fear of cardiovascular exercise was beginning to lift. For decades, health reformers had trumpeted the benefits of fitness, and during the 1880s, the United States saw a spike in organized physical activity. Citizens of America's growing cities tried new sports such as baseball and football, and exercise advocates built the first public playgrounds and pushed for physical activity for both boys and girls. Doctors continued to caution against overexertion, but they acknowledged that in moderation, fresh air and exercise tended to improve patients' health. The high-wheel bicycle of the 1880s proved the benefits of regular exercise to those who could ride it. Proponents made extravagant claims for the risky machine's ability to restore well-being. For constipation, sleeplessness, dyspepsia, and many other ills which flesh is heir to, not to speak of melancholy, all are curable, or certainly to be improved, by the new remedy, bicycle, wrote a Texas physician in 1883. It is always an excellent prescription for the convalescents and nearly always for chronic invalids. Not everyone could take the prescription, though. High-wheeled cycling and rigorous team sports were acceptable only for young men. The new games deemed suitable for mixed company, such as lawn tennis and golf, were far less taxing and therefore far less likely to lead to noticeable improvements in fitness. As for working out on your own, the recommended options were either too costly, like horseback riding, or too boring, like indoor calisthenics, to gain much popularity. As a result, many more Americans of the 1880s thought they ought to exercise than actually did it. And I wanted to show you, um, this is from an 1889 exercise manual. So, you know, we're not talking about CrossFit here. They didn't, they weren't interested in sweating. So when the safety bicycle appeared at the end of the decade and Americans began riding in large numbers, an estimated 2 million in 1896 out of a population of about 70 million, few were certain how such vigorous physical activity would affect them. Doctors were wary. Most US physicians believed that patients' conditions were largely based on their habits, their experiences, the weather, and other environmental factors. Good health was a reflection of proper balance among the body's systems and energies. 
A distracted mind could curdle the stomach. A dyspeptic stomach could agitate the mind, writes the medical historian Charles Rosenberg. It was a doctor's job to know each patient well enough to restore balance when something was out of whack, using laxatives, diuretics, and other purging drugs to reboot the system. Even contagious diseases could not be treated in a cookie-cutter fashion, argued an 1883 medical journal editorial. No two instances of typhoid fever or of any other disease are precisely alike. No rule of thumb, no recourse to a formula book will avail for proper treatment even of the typical diseases. To many doctors, advocating a specific drug to cure a specific disease seemed the height of quackery. And just as there were no one-size-fits-all medical treatments, many physicians believed there were no one-size-fits-all exercise routines. While cycling enthusiasts rhapsodized about the safety bicycle's benefits for riders of both sexes and all ages, doctors fretted that many of their patients would be harmed by the new machines. Even seeming success stories were suspect. In an 1895 paper on heart disease, one doctor reported that a patient who had panted for breath after climbing one flight of stairs was now able to cycle up hills with ease. It would be wrong to conclude from this that cycling is not injurious the doctor wrote. There hadn't been enough time to observe the bicycle's long-term effects. Moreover, as an unfamiliar activity, cycling tended to catch the blame for pretty much anything bad that happened to a new rider afterward, up to and including death. Logically, acute injuries were a concern. Though the safety bicycle did greatly reduce the risk of head wounds, it didn't obliterate that risk, particularly among scorchers, thrill-seeking youngsters who hunched over their handlebars and pedaled as fast as they could. And I have a picture of a scorcher for you. This is the unrestrained demon of the wheel. Um, this is from 1893, by the way. It might seem almost impossible to fracture a skull thick enough to permit indulgence in such practices, reported the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal. But the bicycle fool at full speed has been able to accomplish it. Medical journals also noted the danger of road rash and broken bones. More insidious than crash injuries, though, were new chronic complaints attributed to cycling. The bent over posture of the scorcher was thought to cause a permanent hunch called kyphosis bicyclisterum, or familiarly, cyclist stoop. Repeated stress to the cardiovascular system, that is, regular workouts, could lead to irregular heartbeats and poor circulation of bicycle heart. Gripping the handlebars too tightly might cause finger numbness or bicycle hand, and a dusty ride could trigger cyclist sore throat. Practically every body part seemed to have its own cycle-related malady. At least one New York doctor devoted his entire practice to treating such ailments. Of all the physical woes attributed to the bike, though, the one that most strained credulity was the bicycle face. So let's just bring this guy in a little closer. Characterized by wide, wild eyes, a grim set to the mouth, and a migration of facial features toward the center. The disorder was said to result from the stress of incessant balancing. A German philosopher claimed that the condition drained every vestige of intelligence from the sufferer's appearance and rendered children unrecognizable to their own mothers. The bicycle face hung on, too, warned a journalist. Once fixed upon the countenance, it can never be removed. So let's just get that off the screen. This is um, a magazine from 1896. The doctors raising these alarms were careful to state that many of the new diseases affected only cyclists predisposed to them, which would explain why so few of their fellow physicians might have encountered the disorders. Whilst thousands ride immune, a small percentage will suffer, wrote one doctor. Another, who blamed cases of appendicitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and the thyroid condition Graves' disease on excessive cycling, said it didn't matter how many people believed that cycling had improved their health. It would not affect my argument in the least if swarms of them had been rescued from the grave. Nevertheless, the more Americans took to cycling, the more tenuous these claims of danger came to seem. The machine made physical activity both practical and fun. The bicycle is inducing multitudes of people to take regular exercise who have long been in need of such exercise, but who could never be induced to take it by any means hitherto devised, one doctor wrote in Harper's Weekly in 1896. And all that activity had an effect. Riders quickly noticed improved muscle tone, increased strength, better sleep, and brighter moods. Women especially transformed themselves, wrote the novelist Maurice Thompson in 1897. We have already become accustomed to seeing sun-brown faces, once sallow and languid, whisk past us at every turn of the street. 
the magnetism of vivid health has overcome conservative barriers that were impregnable to every other force. The empirical evidence of cycling's health value began to overtake conservative doctors' concerns, as the rhetoric scholar Sarah Overbaugh Hallenbach argues. Though many physicians continued to raise objections to the sport, their voices were increasingly drowned out by those of more observant and pragmatic practitioners. The bicycle face, elbow, back, shoulders, neck, eroticism, wrote one military doctor in 1896, I pass as not worthy of serious consideration. Rather than discourage bicycle use, most physicians came to cautiously endorse it. So long as a cyclist can breathe with the mouth shut, wrote one such doctor in 1895, he is certainly perfectly safe. Some went further, citing evidence of the bike's benefits for heart patients, migraine sufferers, diabetics, and others with chronic conditions. In Chicago, the demand for injectable morphine dropped as patients with anxiety or insomnia discovered that a long spin in the fresh air on a cycle induces sweet sleep it's better than their favorite drug, the Bulletin of Pharmacy reported. This shift paralleled a transformation in medical thinking during the 1890s when American physicians increasingly embraced the scientific method. Some clinics in continental Europe had adopted this evidence-based approach early in the 19th century, using statistics to determine the efficacy of treatments and evaluating patients' conditions according to universal norms, rather than trying to define what was normal for each individual patient. In the United States, however, doctors arguing for this approach were long in the minority. Only at the very end of the 19th century did a research-based curriculum take hold at U.S. medical schools. It would be folly to suggest that the bicycle alone caused this transformation. Many other factors were at play, such as improved transatlantic communication, a flux of, an influx of European immigrants, including scientists, and a snowballing of evidence for new medical concepts, such as the germ theory of disease. But even if the bike did not independently modernize American medicine, its unprecedented impact on fitness and the clash this revealed between what doctors said and what experience showed may well have accelerated the shift. Much as the bicycle triggered changes in women's dress that high-minded advocacy could not, it bolstered scientists' then radical argument that what is good for one human body tends to be just as good for another. To the bicycle faithful of the 1890s, this seemed to be just the beginning of the changes that the machine would bring about. The gulf between social classes would recede under the influence of this great leveler, one enthusiast wrote in the Century magazine. It puts the poor man on the level with the rich, enabling him to sing the song of the open road as freely as the millionaire, and to widen his knowledge by visiting the regions near to or far from his home, observing how other men live. And while women may not yet have had full access to higher education or even the right to vote, the unchaperoned, self-propelled bloomer girl seemed to be pedaling in that direction. In possession of her bicycle, the daughter of the 19th century feels that the declaration of her independence has been proclaimed, wrote one female journalist. And in the fullness of time, all things will be added to complete her happiness and prosperity. The first wave feminist Susan B. Anthony was born in 1820, one year after the first Draisine was exhibited in the US. By the time of the safety bicycle boom of the 1890s, she was a snowy-haired eminence, too old to risk riding, but she had an opinion of the sport. I'll tell you what I think of bicycling, she said in an 1896 newspaper interview as she leaned forward to lay a hand on the reporter's arm. I think it has done more to emancipate women than any one thing in the world. Thank you. So, so you're a cyclist yourself, I believe, yeah. riding around Bethesda, Washington, D.C. And uh, you know, it's, it's clear that um, cyclists are kind of not necessarily representative of the population <laughs> as a whole, right? We've got you know, kids riding and you know, um, you know, some city people who may not be able to afford a car. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of cyclists are you know, upper middle class, uh, very white, uh, you know, more, more male than female. You know, if you look at uh, uh, sports cycling, for example, um, What's, what's your take on that? Well, that's the way it's always been, pretty much. Um, in this country, the bicycle industry has been dominated by white, older white men. And what's happening right now is that, you know, we have a very diverse population, but the bicycle is uh, popular in cities among prosperous people. So you have these whole swaths of kids who are, live in rural places or live in 
exurbs where it's really not safe. There aren't places for kids to ride bikes, or it's not part of their their family's tradition if they're immigrants. And so you've got you've got kind of this bifurcation of the population where uh, people who love bikes, who they may buy a new bike every year, every five years, and they're 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 very into the sport and they're getting more into it. They're spending more money on it. But then at the at the other end, you have the people who you would expect to be growing up into the sport are not, they're doing other things. It's, a, it's something that bicycle manufacturers are, are really puzzling over right now. You're focusing on bicycles in America. What was happening across the pond? Was there a similar story playing out in Europe or were things different? It, it depends because this, this book covers 200 years. So there were, um, there were periods where things went in parallel, like this period that I'm talking about that things tended to emerge in England or in France and then get heard of over here. In some cases, there were things that were happening here first that may have translated back over there. It, it's a little murky. Um, there, the time, and these booms tended to happen on both sides at the same time. So in 1819, 18, 18, 18, 19, people were crazy for the Draisine in France and England. In 1869, there was another uh, velocipede craze in both places. Then here, it kind of dropped off, kept on there, but then immediately, immediately, you know, within 10 years was back here. And then the 1890s bicycle boom was, was in the Western world, so in Europe as well as here. What happened right after that with the crash, um, people kept riding bikes in Europe, and adults kept riding them for utility, even if not out of fashion, um, because of fashion. But here, um, it quickly became something that adults did not do and the, the industry focused on selling to kids. And that was, that's the main difference between here and there was that for most of the 20th century, it really, riding a bicycle was not really something that a, an adult would think of doing, particularly you know, where other adults could see them. So hopefully that's changed now. So your book is uh, primarily about uh, sort of the history of cycling in uh, North America. I'm kind of curious where you think things are heading and where, you know, how some of these historical sort of uh, trends might be sort of manifesting themselves now? That is a great question. Um, there are some question marks, though. There are some things that we don't know that are going to direct. I mean, looking at the history of cycling, um, it's very up and down. There's very boom and bust. So just if you're reading the patterns, you would say, well, right now it's really popular in, in cities, and in 10 years, everyone's going to be doing something else but then it'll come back. Now, the, the main question mark is what's gonna happen with self-driving cars, like the Google car, because there are people who think that, you know, I mean, these are coming, right? And there are people who think that they're going to um, reduce private car ownership and reduce traffic to the extent that the roads will become much more accommodating to cyclists. And also, since fewer people own cars, people and drivers will kind of, there will be more of a meeting of the minds instead of this fight for asphalt. Um, if things go wrong, there could be a lot of private self-driving cars that are just kind of bumper carring into each other all day, waiting for their owners to get off work, and it becomes, if they're poorly programmed or if they're poorly regulated, the, the roads then become someplace, again, that's very unsafe for cyclists and people stop doing it. And that may go city by city, you know, or state by state, depending on how the, the um, organizations and respond to this new technology. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.